Hello, everyone. We want to welcome you to our expert guide to managing your work patrons workshop today. I'm Josh Hutchings. I'm going to be your trainer. And I am here and joined uh, by one of our other great trainers, Seneca. She'll be doing all of our Q&A today. Uh, so if you do have any questions throughout, make sure to use our Q&A feature built into the Zoom service. You should see a little button down at the bottom of your little toolbar. And uh, we will also have a Q&A session um, throughout, one in the middle and then one at the end. So if you have a question that applies to the whole group, we may answer it for everyone. And you'll notice that you can actually vote on questions. So if you see a question that somebody else has posed, that would be your question as well. Make sure to vote on it and we'll uh, make sure to answer it for the group. We have turned off the chat for today. So that's, you wanna make sure all your questions do go through Q&A. Uh, all right, so <laughs> today we're gonna to be talking about mainly how to ma better manage your patrons in the Alexandria program. We wanna make this a very thorough and a little bit more kind of an expert guide to managing patrons. But we are also going to be including some littler aspects that you may already know but are important just to have a, a better understanding of the bigger picture. So if we do talk about anything that you already know, sorry for the repeat, <laughs> but hopefully we give you some good tools to help you pass that. All right, so you see here for our agenda today, we're gonna to start off talking about the patron management screen and its related preferences. We're gonna move on to importing our patrons and talking about the best process for doing so. And then we're also gonna follow up with some patron reports and utilities that tend to be a little bit common. All right, so to start off with, the patron management screen, helpful preferences and patron policies and security fields. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to Alexandria. All right, and the screen that I have up right now is the patron screen itself. Now to start off with, most of this you're gonna be very familiar with, but I wanna highlight a few important fields that may not be the things that you would normally think about or some that uh, maybe aren't utilized as well. First and foremost, let me talk about the fields that are absolutely necessary for importing a patron file. Now, these apply to imports that you might do or to other neat and important parts of the program. The absolute necessary ones though are the first name, the last name, and preferably a barcode. And we normally suggest to most folks that if you're using homeroom management throughout the program, such as in your reports, in this circulation screen that you include homeroom as well. You'll see our terminology has changed to room number here, which is an important part of what we're gonna be talking about in managing this patron screen. And also for those of you who do allow your people to log in, make sure you include login credentials unless the students themselves dictate those. But those also can be imported. So again, that first and last name and the barcode are the most important, but pretty much any of the other ones can be imported as long as they are what you use within your program. Now, if you do use Homeroom and you import it, a very important place where that does apply is here in the blue circulation screen. And then under this circulation tab and the room number sub tab. In, by default in the program, you're have, gonna have it called Homeroom but we do have a change to room number just to help highlight that you can change that to whatever format you might want. Why this is handy is because most folks who do have their, uh, their younger kids come in, usually uh, grades you know, kindergarten up until maybe sixth, probably have them come in in a homeroom format. So if you've got a whole group of kids from one classroom there, to help you not have to worry about maybe having a barcode sheet book next to you, or maybe having to search for each and every kid using the lookup command, you can actually have a list of all of those students from that homeroom right here. Now, we're going to be talking about in a little bit the importance of managing the homeroom from year to year, as well as other fields that can be updated in student files, such as say email addresses, contact information, uh, maybe a second location such as uh, like a reading teacher um, or their reading levels and grades. You can also manage policies through imports. So if that's something that you're not doing currently, that's an important thing to consider as an option. For the policy to be importable though, you would need to have your policy information within your student information system. Now, a lot of student information systems do allow you to put extra fields in there that wouldn't be a standard field that would normally be in a student information system. So as long as you've set up your policies, 
in a, uh, a way that you can communicate to the student information system, then you can have that imported. And it's all based on the grade, really, usually for most folks. So, all right, that's starting off there. So what I'm gonna do is uh, kind of to branch off from here, I'm gonna open up our preferences window. And to do so, I'm gonna pop to our tools window here with that little toolbox and then open up preferences at the top right because there are a few important preferences to talk about in adjusting that screen and making it more kind of your thing. Now, for those of you who are following along, great. If not, make sure you've got your pad and paper there because these are some important things we're gonna go through. And it's gonna feel like I'm kind of going through them fast, but make, you know, your, give yourself a little shorthand notes. All right, to start off with, I'm clicking patrons up at the top left. And some of the most important uh, preferences you'll have are under here under this window. Uh, two, under the patron rules tab, is keeping history for all patrons and disabling card expiration dates. Sometimes people tend to uh, suffer with that uh, card expiration date filled under their patron screen. It pops up in the circulation screen as well, so it can be a little annoying. So that can be disabled here just by clicking that and it'll magically disappear. <laughs> so you won't have to see it any longer. And most folks really don't tend to manage their card expiration dates through the program. So it's generally turned off. And another one that's a little bit uh, of kind of a hidden gem is keeping patron history. It's uh, for those of you who want to be able to run patron history reports or bringing it up under the, uh, the details for the patron, uh, you'll want to make sure that this is turned on. So it's an important thing to check. <clears throat> Moving on from there, um, I'm going to kind of skip past some of the patron defaults. Okay. Um, and while we're here, somebody brought up that they would like to see the next barcode. So for those of you who don't happen to you uh, assign your patrons barcodes from the student information system, that's generally like a student number or some other internal number that's used for reference within the school. Sometimes it may be the same as like the lunch number or something like that. So if you don't use an internal number like that, then the program can assign a barcode to your patrons as you import them or as you manually add them to the program. This feature right here under patron defaults and next barcode is where you tell the program what barcode number to use. Now why this is important is because you don't want barcodes overlapping between your patrons and your items. And this is a great place to ensure it will never happen. We normally suggest using shorter barcodes for your patrons because you tend to type those a lot more. Normally for your books, you're gonna be scanning barcodes. So usually it's okay to have those be a tad longer. Uh, we have a default one in there, as you can see here, this is gonna be the same one that you have in your program by default, but this can be changed to whatever you'd like. We normally suggest having at least three numbers though, normally something over you know, 200. All right. And uh, you have a few other little you know, clerical preferences here that normally folks just leave as they are. And patron pictures, <laughs> that's kind of straightforward. This is the, just the picture that you would have that would show up if you haven't yourself chosen um, or imported a picture for the patron. That's a little bit more personalized. Another very important preference screen for your patrons is the grade table. Now, if you haven't played with this, give yourself a little assignment to make sure you go and you check it out. Why this is important though, is it's used in, throughout the program in a few different ways. And it may be used in some ways that you might not intuitively kind of think about. An important one is, this is how you tell the program how to sort your reports, or also how to sort for your patron screen. I'm gonna pop back here just to kind of illustrate it, when you're doing a search. So if I do a search you know, via grade, and I wanna see a list of people by grade, this preference screen, here is what helps them be in order. So what you wanna do is you wanna come through here and you wanna make sure that this list of grades matches your grade spread exactly. Now, sometimes we'll have more in here by default than you need, so you can pop under here, highlight them, and just click remove. Uh, or you can click to edit, and that'll give you the ability to alter whatever the term is. Now, the sort here, that's just the sort that I was mentioning, that's the order it will be in. The grade, that's what's in your grade field. So say for example, we're using Darla Anderson here as an example. If you come all the way mostly to the bottom here, you've got grade 11. So if I pop back here, that would be her grade here. So if I 
use my utility at the end of the advanced grade, which some of you may do manually if you are moving your kids' data from one grade or homeroom or policy from the end of the year to the next, um, or I could click this advanced all grades button here, which some folks will do. They'll just come to the screen at the end of the year or the, at the beginning of the year, and they'll make sure everything looks good, and they have, may advance grades at that point. Normally, you want to advance your grades or make changes to your existing person data before you import your new people or before you put in your new people. The reason for that is if you advance all grades after you've put your new people in, it will advance theirs as well. So you want to make sure you do any large data changes before you've put your new people in. A few other fun little features under here. If you look at the last grade graduated, this is a handy tool for those of you who do manually manage your data. When you hit advanced grades here, no matter which one of these is your last grade, last in the list, it will then turn that person's grade filled to whatever this term is. Now you can change it to whatever you'd like. It doesn't have to be graduated, but you wanna make sure it's a term that's easy for you to recognize. And the reason that that's handy to have is because now all of those people who have essentially left the school, whether, whether it be grade 12 or grade six, whatever your cutoff date is, those people are set to the side under that term. And we'll talk more about setting up a term other than this to help you manage your people. But that gives you the ability to bring them up on reports, to delete them easily in one group if you need, or maybe to see all of those lost items that have left your facility with those people that you might not be have coming back. <laughs> and so you'll need to figure out a way to replace them. So, and then uh, last but not least, you can turn on the advance after filled. That gives you the ability to have it auto advance. So that way you yourself don't have to worry about it. Most folks like to do it they, themselves so they feel you know, a little bit more in charge of the process, but that is a feature as well. So popping back to our main preference screen, gonna go ahead and take a look at next, our circulation preferences. That's right below patrons there. And under our circulation preferences, we've got some important patron-oriented fields right here up at the top. Now, one of them, the display copy condition, is for books. But for those of you who like to be able to see more information on your blue circulation screen, you can turn on the display patron lexile, display patron reading level, and those, if we pop back over here and look at Darla, those actually pop up for her. And a lot of librarians tend to use, utilize that as they're checking books in or out or verifying what books the kids are checking out. And so it's handy to have that there as opposed to having to maybe bring up a patron details window to view that stuff or having to even go back to the patron screen or having to view it somewhere else outside of the program. So popping back to our preference window here. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a moment, this isn't a bad place for you to go through in, in general. There are a few other very handy preferences that you can have pop up. Um, some of the important ones though are enabling these patron alerts that pop up as you're in that checkout screen. So as you are having kids come and check out books, this will, if these are turned on, they'll give you a head up, heads up if a person, as they become current in that screen, becomes alert. So an actual pop-up will come up and say they have an overdue or an in-stock hold or a reservation. All right, moving on from this tab here, I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to our last one, circulation settings. And under circulation settings, there's a kind of a fun little hidden feature that you may not be aware of, but it's called the uh, automatic email notification. Now, depending on what your needs are, uh, you know, and if you actually send out notifications to the students themselves or to parents, uh, this, you may find this a good solution to do so because it takes a lot of the, the legwork and the clerical work out of the process for you. All you really need is if we pop to, back to our circulation window here and go under patrons, all you need is to have this email address filled out for your patron file. Now that can be the individual patron themselves, it could be their parent, it could be both. Uh, if you want to have multiple emails under this field, all you need is a comma separating them, and that'll allow you to email as many people as you want. But as long as that email is there, and your email is also set up in the program, then with this turned on, it will automatically send out notifications for a list of different reasons. And what I'm gonna do is just to have a visual for you guys, is I'm gonna click our question mark up the top right and go to our wiki page for this. 
and you'll see under enable automatic email notifications here, we've got our list of the reasons it goes out for. So to start off with, a hold is placed, a hold expires, an in-stock hold is available, an in-stock hold expires, items become overdue, a reservation is placed, a reservation, a reservation is removed, and a recall is issued. Now, do remember, guys, if you feel like I'm going fast through some of this, I apologize. Uh, you know, we want to make it so that it's useful for everybody. But this is going to be recorded, so you can always go back and listen to any of this. But uh, this is a great place to come if you want to see this list, because this list is, like I said, it's a little long. <laughs> um, one of the most important ones, though, is uh, for the overdue. And that, that way you can have that message actually send out a notification. And what happens is it's the next day that the item becomes due. It will send a notification to that person. Same thing with the rest of these. You may not use reservations. Um, you, know, you may use holds, though. So this is a great way to communicate with your patrons automatically so you yourself don't have to do any of that legwork. Now you can, of course, set up individual reports and schedule them, which we'll talk a little bit more about late, later. But this is just a way to help you do all that in one go. So, all right, popping out of our wiki here and back to our preferences, I'm gonna go ahead and leave our circulation press and I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to our policies. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with policies or don't like to mess with it, they can be a little scary. Um, I'm just going to try to give you a, a quick glance over and get you started. Patron policies, uh, they tend to be a little more used for uh, specific reasons around like, you know, like a grade. So, so your higher grade, your, your, your older kids, they may be able to check out more books. They may be able to check them out for longer. You may want to have them have fines, whereas younger kids, Maybe they can only check out one or two books or only for a week, or you don't want to give them fines because they're too young and it's just what happens. So what I can do is I can set up a, a patron policy that I want to have reflect that. We've got some default ones in here that we have set up already. Now, by the way, I'm using one of our demos. We do have a customer facing demo. So if for some reason you want to see an example of policies set up already that you yourself might want to like mirror or play with, you can go to uh, our demo, which is customer facing. It's demo.goalexandria.com and just go there and you'll see the credentials are demo and demo, all lowercase, demo. So pop there, guys, if you want to play with something. That one, it resets every night, so you won't be able to put something in and see it day after day, but that'll give you the ability to play with something and not have it be in your own data so that it's okay if you quote unquote break something. <laughs> All right, so the, the demo that I do have here though is a high school student. If I'm wanting to create a new one, I just hit the add button down at the bottom left here. It'll pop up with the screen asking me what kind of a policy name I do want to put in. So let's say, you know, I want to put it in my upper grades. It can be whatever terminology you want. This term is going to show up under this patron window here under policy. It's going to show up on reports and throughout the program. So make it a term that's easy for you to remember, use, and for other people to recognize without confusion. And it's also going to solicit a policy short code. This also shows up throughout the program in various places, uh, and it will be less seen by general people. So make it something that's easier for you to remember. So if it's like upper grade, maybe we can call it UPG, something easy. Uh, down below that, we have the option for statistics groups. Uh, statistics groups can be very handy to, for our statistics reports. So if you're wanting to see greater usage reports, you'll see we have some already under our, our reports, but we have a nice statistics section. You want to pay attention to the statistics group based on your policy. And, <clears throat> and with that statistics groups, that's your kind of um, manual way of saying, I want to focus on how this one unique group uses their items. And this might actually be a deciding factor in how you set up your policies, because you may want to collect information on a specific group as opposed to just setting up a group that's going to um, determine how they check books out, you know, such as loan periods or amount of items they want to check out. So definitely consider that statistics groups as a feature of it. So you'll see just to kind of reference that uh, statistics group again, I've got my new upper grade here. And down below here is my statistics group of upper grades. And that'll show up under the uh, st um, statistics reports and throughout the program. So, and there can be as many of these policies you might need. So don't feel like you're limited to, to one or the other. 
Um, a lot of folks don't realize too when they're setting up these uh, statistics groups is you can actually have multiple policies under one particular statistics group. So if you still want to use statistics, but you want it to be specific to something like upper grades or one or two grades, you can actually have an individual policy, say for each and every grade, but then put them under the same statistics group. So it's kind of a little uh, you know, hidden fun thing there that can help with your statistics gathering. So, but once you've got these patron policies set up, that's when you would just take the time to kind of go through this line by line. I understand that um, you know, policies are really in depth here and this isn't really the time or form for us to kind of go through them, but uh, you wanna make sure that any changes you're making, you're immediately going and testing afterwards so that you can ensure you like the results. And of course, if you have any questions, do give us a call. That's what we're here for. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, re-log in. Sorry, I, I clicked the wrong button here on my keyboard. <laughs> Even trainers do funny things too. So, all right. And then after that, I'm gonna pop up to our localization. And under localization, I'm gonna go ahead and go under terminology right in the middle here. And under terminology, you'll see off to the left side, I've got a bunch of patron fields. Now, if you're gonna tinker with your terminology, make sure to read the little header here up at the top. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it at all, uh, if you remember, I referenced this room number as an alternative to say homeroom. So if we pop back over to your patrons, you'll see there's my room number. So I can come under here and I can change that to homeroom or whatever I might use at my school or my library, come back here and refresh it. And it should reflect that change that I've made. We'll bring Darla back up. There she is, and homeroom. So that terminology can be very handy. Now, all of these show up on reports and throughout the program. So it it's extends past just this patron screen, but it's a great way for you to help keep all of your patron information together. And also to avoid having to try to hijack a certain field, you know, just for a term that you guys use internally that we don't necessarily have a field for. So. This is a fun one, come in here and play with these. <laughs> For those that uh, aren't a little bit more clear, the government ID is usually like a social security number. Now, now and of course you don't have to use any of these fields. So if it's one you don't want to use, that's just fine. So, all right, so that's our terminology field. I'm gonna go pop back here to our other screen. Uh, last preference screen, but very important, is our security screen off to the far middle right here. You can see it looks like a little shield. Now where this comes in handy is in reference to this security group for your patrons. Now by default in Alexandria, we have a patron security group set up. If for some reason you find you need to have more than one security group, or you need them to act differently in Alexandria, this is where you come, is this to, to this security preference. Now I'm gonna go ahead and choose that particular security group that we have for our kids, patron and it brings up a unique set of fields specific to them and to that policy. Now, if you find that you do need to actually have more than one policy for your kids, because a uh, security group, sorry, policy, <laughs> make sure I use the right term or it's confusing. If you find that you do need to have uh, more than one security group for your kids, you can click this plus button down at the bottom left here, and that will allow you to create a brand new one with its own name, so you could theoretically have one for, say, your upper grades, because your upper grades may be able to write reviews or perform holds, but your younger kids might not be able to. It's a common situation. Just because you have our default in there doesn't mean you're sunk and you have to have all of your kids be managed the same way. So feel free to create as many of these security groups as you want. Um, but just to explain some of these fields off to the right here, uh, some of these are going to be straightforward. Uh, such as holds or reservations. Now, an important thing to explain about our drop downs is normally the top option of the drop down is the least rights, and the one below or down, you know, further down is the most rights. Sometimes it's two options, sometimes it's a few different ones, and some of them are, are a little bit different. So, um, moving down, patron status. Uh, this refers to the actual patron status window, which we'll take a look at in a quick sec here using Darla as an example. But as I mentioned at the top, that's the least rights, and down below is where they have full rights. 
Now, this gives your kids the ability to view their personal information that was imported originally when they were put into the program or when uh, you yourself manually type them in. Now, it can be the basic access of just being able to view that window if they can just view their contact information as well, uh, or if you, even if they can edit their contact information. And then also, even if you want to allow them to edit their username and password. Now, for those of you who do allow your kids to sign into the program in some of the patron-facing interfaces, uh, you may want to have the passwords locked down. And for some of you, you may not. You may want to give them the rights to change these so that they can manage them on their own. It's kind of similar to what you'd have at, say, you know, uh, other programs where people can log in and manage their own data. That's just kind of you giving them those rights. And then edit gives them the rights to just manage everything. They've got total control. Now, this will make a little bit more sense when, once we get under that patron status window so you can actually see these fields in action. So um, then under renewals here, that gives them the ability to perform their own renewal. They can do that under that patron status window. And then reviews. Actually, let's, uh, let's take a look at that patron status window here while I've got a little bit of a juncture because we can move on and take a look at other screens. So to open up my, uh, my window for that patron status, I'm gonna go ahead and click my researcher here. Now this is in my demo, so yours may look a little different. The reason I'm going here is because I do have a little shortcut to get there. That's this little status button. Now, this shortcut can be created with your URL to Alexandria. You just need to make sure you have slash status on the end. And that's similar to any of the other little shortcuts you can use throughout the program. I'm going to go ahead and use our example of Darla to log us in. And I'm going to say never save. You never want to do that on a public computer. And now that we're under our patron status window, I'll go ahead and explain those fields we just talked about. So um, I mentioned that they could, you can give them the option of changing their account information. This is where that account information is. And also you can give them the ability to alter their username and password. So they can come under here, log in and change that username and password if they have rights. You can of course have it turned off. So a few other things they can do, they can manage holds and reservations if that's turned on. They can come under here and see the list of holds they have. They can also view any reservation or reviews that they've done, which we'll take a look at in a sec. They can also see any book lists they've created, which is a handy feature of logging in and having your students with those passwords or not. Um, also, items that they have checked out. This is also where they would have the ability to do a, re a re <clears throat> pardon me, a renewal. So that's that preference right there for renewals. So that's your patron status window. Another place you might be familiar with seeing that patron status window is your search screen. So I'm gonna click that search screen there. It's this little two person face up at the top left here, which if somebody logs in to our librarian interface, we'll log Darla back in. It automatically gives them the right to click that and they don't even, even technically have to log in. It'll just take them right to their person status window. So this is the window we were just looking at. So, so if you are training your people to log in, that's a great place to refer them to so they can see their own personal information. One thing that's cool about that window is if you are going to be, you know, utilizing just this, you know, unique little link or URL here, slash, say slash status, you can put that up on the facility website. So that way people, if you can say, hey, go to the facility website to check out, you know, see what books you have checked out or to manage your checked out books. And they can go directly to a link you would have on the facility website and see that without having to worry about going, say, through this screen or somewhere else. So, and I'm not sure if you yourselves manage any of your web stuff for the facility, but that's something you can always pass on to your web managers. Other important things when you're logged in here and that relate to the uh, preferences for, mm. <laughs> that relate to the preferences for our security groups is reviews. Now reviews give your people the ability to click those stars in the search screen and to add a review, to have you ensure that there, it needs to be approved or to just always approve it. Now if you have say a security group for your staff members and they themselves add reviews, you may have it turned on, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> you may have it turned on to allow those to always be approved. Okay. 
And if you have it set to add always approved for your staff, the, the review will automatically post. Excuse me, guys, got a little tickle in my throat. <laughs> All right, and, but if you have it set to always add re and re require approval, then what it will do is it will send it to a review management screen where you will be able to see the reviews beforehand. And I'll go ahead and show you that here in a quick sec. Another important feature related to the reviews is also how they show up in the reviews. So if you wanna make them more anonymous or just initials, because you never know, sometimes kids, you know, they can, <laughs> they can tease. So maybe you wanna make it a little bit more, um, you know, less of their face. Or maybe the kids really like to own the fact that they put in their reviews. Again, this could be specific to, you know, the person um, security group. So you could have staff's name show up, but not your students. And last but not least, uh, the password related things. So you can specify that if they are going to be setting up their own password, uh, you, they would need to make it strong. And um, so that would be such as multiple character, different character types, uh, uppercase, lowercase, and special characters, as well as a length requirement. So, oh, and also of course, charges. If uh, charges is turned on, this gives them the ability to actually make a payment through the status screen. But that's all of our security preferences. Um, let me go ahead and pop over to our search window and just highlight that review section. So if that is turned on and they have the capability of writing a review, once they have a book up, they would simply click on the stars here for reviews. Under this review window, they can see all of the existing reviews as well as click uh, the option right at the top left here to write their own review. Now that takes them into a screen. I mean, it does mention that it needs approval, <laughs> so it gives them a little bit of a heads up. But you can say something like, I loved it. And once you're done, you hit submit, and that sends your review through. Oh, and you can specify your stars too. That's an important thing. Once the review is written, it can be viewed under our review management screen, like I mentioned. Let me go ahead and open that up. So I've taken us back to our librarian interface here, and I'm gonna pop us under tools. And under tools, you'll see that the uh, review option is down at the bottom left. And that's that review management screen specifically. All right, now by default, it's not going to show you any of the reviews. So if you're just wanting to see reviews in general, you can hit the search button or like the patron screen, you've got your little search option down at the bottom left and you can just do a search for any or all reviews. So you can specify you know, ratings, a particular status. So if you've got ones that you need to approve, you can pop under here and say, hey, I wanna see all of them that I need to approve. So maybe set yourself up with like a little habit that you have, you know, like once a week or something where you do your, your needs approval. Once under there though, um, you select the particular review that you would like to affect or change. Uh, you actually have the option of retyping some of it. So if you see like a misspell or maybe there's a word in there that needs to be, you know, taken care of or something, you can alter it. Um, you can also uh, reject it so that if it's rejected, it won't show up in the program. Now, that'll actually tell the people who that, that it has been rejected under their patron status window. So that way, if they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know where my review is, you can always tell your, your kids, hey, make sure you go and take a look at your review section under the patron status if you wanna see what's going on with your reviews. And it'll actually show them that it was rejected there. So, but that's your review management screen. It's pretty simple, <laughs> nothing too complex, but it's kind of a fun thing for you guys to play with uh, when you have the time, as well as the kids. And it generates a lot more interest in the library and kind of gives them some ownership over their reading. So. And that's definitely something you need. <laughs> more, more, more buttons and clicks, right? <laughs> it's their own little social media built into Alex. All right, guys. So that's pretty much the patron screen, helpful preferences to know, policies and security fields. I'm gonna go ahead and move us on to our next section, which is importing your patron information. Um, I, I am gonna have us, uh, I, um, I, I'm, so I'm gonna talk about our importing our patron information. And I am gonna talk about the recommended Alexandria import method. Now, if you remember back to when I was talking about the patron screen, I mentioned the most important fields for us to look at. And so we're gonna be talking about those. And also we'll mention how to import patron pictures. So popping back to our screen here, I'm gonna go ahead and open up our import window. Now there's a few different ways that you can do imports. You can import once, say at the beginning of the year, or you can import regularly. And the, the regular imports 
can be scheduled here under the same import screen. Now, for those of you who have your student bodies changing often, it's important probably to do regular imports to keep you from having to do that yourself individually. <coughs> I apologize, guys. That tickle. <laughs> and for some of you, you may not manage your imports at all. You may have a tech do that for you. And if that's the case, then this is where you would want to direct them to. Now, your techs, just as well as yourselves, they have the option of having, uh, you know, the 24-7 customer support with us. So make sure you refer them to us if they have any questions or need any assistance. So to start off with, to import a patron file, you'll want to pop under Browse, identify that particular file that you're going to import. And once you've got that in there, you will have the option of uh, specifying field mapping. So saying which particular fields are going to come under. Most folks normally, if they're going to be setting up their, their import file, they will get it from a student information system. Uh, if your data manager has the ability to make sure it's a nice clean file right off the bat, that's great. Sometimes you may have to open it up and say Excel and tinker with it yourself, remove unnecessary fields. But the field mapping does give you the ability to actually not show or not import certain fields that might have come from that import file. So you have the ability of kind of cleaning it up yourself through the program as well. So uh, important things to consider down below here. Uh, for any of you who already have kids who are already in the program from year to year, um, you probably aren't going to be utilizing a lot of this because it's going to be importing through and then just updating those fields. So you may have the patron policy be imported. Or you may even be specifying the security group in your import as well. So, uh, but you normally do want to skip the first record if you have a header row. That will keep it from importing all of those fields like, you know, name, first name, last name, barcode, and making that a patron for you. And down below here where it says to always create new records on import or allow import to modify existing records, that's looking specifically for that patron barcode number, first and foremost. So, and as if you remember, I mentioned that's one of our most important ones to import. And that's what's going to give it the ability to recognize. There are some other fields that it will recognize. So, and we'll update that person field based on those. All right. And that's what you want to have it set to if you're going to be keeping your kids in the system from year to year so that it can simply update their fields. Next, um, barcode handling. We had a question earlier about, uh, you know, the default next barcode. That's actually where this shows up here. So <clears throat> this screen here will recognize what you've set into your preferences. And when you import a list of people, whether it be staff, students, uh, patrons, it will start with this barcode and consecutively, consecutively add the next number in that barcode range to each and every person on the list. Um, and that's where you can specify if you want it to assign the new barcodes there or use it barcodes in your import file if they're included. Normally, if you've got your student number in the import file, you'll be using the barcodes in that import file. Now, our standard or our suggested Alexandria import process is the very first time you import a patron, to ensure you do have a unique number for them, if you can. Uh, like I mentioned, that's normally like a student number or some other internal reference number that you might use throughout the school, like the lunch number, whatever it might be. But if this is a number that you have access to through say your student information system or whatever, um, and you're going to have that for the next coming oncoming year or years, then you can continually update all of this information and make this import process a lot quicker and easier for yourself. Because otherwise, if you're not doing an import that recognizes the barcode and updates all of these fields, then you've got to manually do that yourself. Now we do have processes in place in the program to help you manually move homerooms for your, all of your kids or to move the policies forward or grades, but you, know, you do have to do individual utilities or individual processes for each and every one of those fields. Having it all be managed by the import makes it so much easier. So if you have any questions about setting that up or when you started off, you didn't do that, feel free to give us a call and talk to us about it. We can remote in, we can take a look at your individual data and get an idea of what we can do you know, to set up a plan for you to move into that best practice to save you a lot of time. 
uh, you know, <laughs> I know how much time librarians normally have, especially when school's at its end or, uh, you know, as the new year's beginning. So we want to make that time period as easy on you as possible. So now that's the uh, individual import. If you are looking to do a scheduled one, that's just under the saved section here. So well, we'll, we'll leave that one and not get too in depth. Um, and last but not least, we've got our patron pictures. Now, important thing to remember about patron pictures is, uh, and it kind of gives you a little summary right here, which you can read once you get to that part of your process, is the file for all of your pictures does need to be zipped. And I'll go ahead and hit browse here. Go to my desktop, and I've gone ahead and set up like a zipped picture file. The program will then just recognize that file and tell you that it's recognized it. Um, and by default, it's already set to patron pictures. This is obviously going to be the one you're probably going to be using the most. Uh, it's a little bit more rare that you would be importing item cover art or textbook cover art. For those of you who have, uh, you know, odd um, internet or other services, or maybe your, your auto cover art feature can't be used for some reason, that's where these other ones would come in handy. But with this checked, you just hit run. And as long as the name of each picture matches that student barcode number, so say, for example, I have a picture for Darla and it's named 1001.jpg or whatever image or format you want, then it will take that picture and it will attach it to her file or everyone's files based on the name of the picture. So pretty easy, <laughs> nothing too complex. So that's our importing screen. Uh, and let's go ahead and move on to our uh, patron reports and our patron utilities. And I've got a few ones that I'm gonna just uh, talk about as suggestions. So first and foremost, I'll go ahead and bring up our report window. All right, and once under our report window, I'm gonna make sure our, we're under our quick tab so that we're not uh, using any saved reports but creating new ones. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight our patron section. Do remember that if you ever need to find a particular report and you're not sure where it would be, you can always use our little search button up at the section up at the top right. You do want to be careful about what section you're under because then that search bar will only search that particular section you've selected. So I'm going to choose patrons here. Click our little drop down so we can see our different sections. And first I'm going to talk about patron barcode labels. We have a lot of people who print barcode labels every year for all of their homerooms so, or for their grades so that they can find their kids faster. So I'm going to go ahead and select these. And they'll normally keep like a book of those barcodes next to their computer. If you don't do that, that's fine. Um, for those of you who do, this is a very common report. So once I've selected that report, it brings up our selection window down below of the different ways that I can specify what group I'm going to print this report for. And this is the same for all reports. For those of you who are familiar, sorry about the review, um, but this is where you say who or what needs to be on the report. And then under options is the template or the layout of the report that you're going to be seeing. So an important one for this one is usually the sort by. Now the sort by is what order everyone's going to be on that report. So if I am going to be having people coming in by homeroom, then I would want to make sure it's sorted by homeroom. Now a really handy feature for some of these sorts is the option for a page break on major sort. Just to explain what that means, is that means it will put a new page for every one of the different sections in our homeroom. So that way it won't merge, you know, Mrs. Allen's class, you know, or with, with Mrs. Mr. Ackerley's. They'll have them be on their own unique separate pages. So it's easier for you to scan through and find the breaks. So, and that page break pops up for grade and policy and other ones. Once you've specified your sort by, down below here, you will set up your barcode image itself. Uh, this is something that we've talked about in other uh, workshops. So if you are wanting more information about this, definitely take a look at those workshops. We talk about uh, how to kind of set these up and make them a little bit more your own. Once you're done setting up this report, if it's going to be a regular one that you're going to run every year, then we always suggest creating a saved report. So that way you've got it set to the side for yourself the next year you come through. And that way you only have to maybe change some of the, the information. So if I click here and create new saved report, it's going to give me the option of giving it a name. And I can pop in here and I can say yearly grade patron barcode labels, whatever it might be. You can even put your own name in there if it's easier. 
for your reference. So I'll hit OK there. So if we look there under my Save tab, and that pops up under any of my saves, there's Josh's yearly grade patron, patron barcode label. So I can bring that up. If I need to change something, I can unlock it, alter whatever particular terms I need to, and that way I can run it every year that one time. Now another uh, very common one are overdue notices. And any notices for anybody is going to be under the circulation section here. So I'm going to go open up the circulation and you'll see we actually have a notices section. Um, what it means by notices is anything that's going to be notifying a person about uh, some particular piece of information, such as that they have overdues or lost items or charges. So I'm going to go ahead and choose our overdue items notice here. This one is you know, handy maybe to give to the individual kids or a parent or uh, maybe even a, a teacher. So if you have your teachers manage the overdue books. The format here is very similar to the last one, but some of these selections are a little bit different. You know, for example, this one gives you the ability to specify you know, what overdue day range. So if you're not worried about books being overdue for the first two weeks, you can put like say 14 days in there and then have the end one, use the end, the end one is a big one. <laughs> and then under our options tab, this is where our format or template is, again, our layout of the report. This one has a sort by as well. So if you are handing this out or setting this to homeroom teachers, say every week or month, you can specify a breakdown there. Uh, normally for most of our report templates, you'll find that we do kind of have a cascading complexity similar to that security screen. So normally the top one is uh, the, the simplest or the smallest. Uh, so we've got a two per page, four per page. If this is a one that you're going to be running regularly, I would suggest running a couple of these and testing them as well. There's no limit to how many reports you can run. And you want to make sure you like it and you're comfortable with it. You know, you don't always have to go with the first one you find. So but once you've specified what por format you want, one thing about those two per page or four per page, you kind of do have to cut those. So if you don't have one of those nice big slice and cutter knives, <laughs> you probably want to go with like a letter. But these do help you to save paper because they're much smaller. So, um, and then you can add extra information to those overdue notices that would be pertinent. So if it's something that's going to a teacher, you may not need like phone number, you know, barcodes, all that. Uh, but if it is going directly to say like the student themselves or maybe the office and the office needs that reference information, you can have that on there as well. This same info is on some of the other ones such as lost books or charge reports. So maybe you need to notify the office of, uh, you know, lost books that they need to pursue for financial reasons because you yourself in the library may not manage it. This information would come in handy for those people being able to contact those students or parents. So now one other cool feature, once you have a, a report saved, is the ability to actually have it mail out, your email out. So if you're wanting to try to save paper, you can pop under a save report. So you see I've gone ahead and just saved this one clicked on it and highlighted it, and you can have it run on a schedule or email out to whoever it, it runs. So, um, and these are separate features. You don't have to have everyone that's scheduled email out or vice versa. Um, you can even have it emailed to your inbox too. So if that's something where you need to get like say a holds report or this notice so that you can track the kids down, you can have it emailed to yourself weekly so you can get that. Just put whatever uh, your email address is in here, and that will go straight to it. Now you can also add um, extra emails. So if you have more than one person it needs to go to, you just put a comma in there and separate those emails with a comma, similar to the patron email screen. So, and under schedule is where you'd specify how often you want it to run. So maybe I want it to run weekly on Mondays at 8 a.m. Once all that's done, don't forget to hit save up at the top right. And that'll then kick that report in. Now, this is another one of those alternatives to our automatic email notifications, if you remember I highlighted from our preferences. And this is where you'd be actually setting these up yourself manually, report by report. So a little bit more work, but it does give you more control over when notifications go out for overdues, holds, et cetera. So one other last report that we've got under here that I'm going to bring up is a, kind of a fun one, but it's our top borrowing patrons. You'll see that's under our patron section and under usage. 
Our top borrowing patrons, patrons is just that. It's a list of the people who borrow the most from the library or check out the most books. Uh, the selections gives you the ability to specify whatever group. So you could say, you know, do it for fun for every grade or homeroom, just kind of get the kids a little bit more interactive with the library. And then under options is where you can specify what time period. So if you're doing it for a particular month or uh, for a particular year or quarter, I've uh, known some people to actually have like contests for how many kids check out books, <laughs> kind of a, a fun cheat way to get kids, uh, you know, checking out books and interested. Um, and then down below, you can specify how many people would be on that particular report. So, all right. So those are a, kind of a good quick glance into reports. Of course, you're probably going to have more reports that you would run and questions. Um, please let us know. We are happy to walk you through, answer any questions you have. So, um, and lastly, pop in under our utilities right there into that tool screen. I've got uh, a couple here that I was going to bring up. A very common one for patron utilities. <clears throat> is the option to remove patrons. Now, at the end of every school year, you're obviously gonna be having kids going from your school, or maybe um, if you're a public library, at the end of you know, like a year or a couple years, you may remove, remove people from the catalog. Uh, this is where you would come to do that in a group format, as opposed to one by one. You'll see, uh, if you look down here alphabetically, you've got remove patrons there. Now, usually through utilities, the selections are a bit more important than they would be under the reports because the selections is how you specify what group you are going to be changing data for or affecting. So say um, I went ahead and I had that grade table move all of my 12th graders into a graduated status at the end of the year. I would come under here and I would say, okay, anybody who's in my program that has graduated as a grade field, I want to kick out because they're done. So this is after maybe you've made sure you have all of their lost books ready to be replaced, you've followed up with any fines they have, now you're good to get them out. Some folks will remove the graduated kids, you know, a couple months after school's over or even the next year because they like to hold on to them for reference or history. So, and some folks like to just get them out right away. So, but this is where you'd come to do that. Now, um, one way that you can uh, forego using that grade field um, and one way we suggest to a lot of folks, because you may have people leaving the school that aren't graduated, they may just be kids who moved out from that year and moved on to another school, is uh, changing that grade field or homeroom to a different term. And it's up to you what term you wanna use. Normally grade tends to be the best, um, but it can be homeroom as well. But what that means is, at the end of the school year or at the beginning, before you import all of your new kids, you can pop under here and you can say, I want to change all of my grades to um, like last year or whatever terminology you want to use. Something that sets them to the side as different than the people you're going to be importing for the new year. Now, if uh, you're one of those people who uses our best practices and you have your kids sit in the program year after year, and when you import, you're matching them based on barcode and just simply updating their fields. This is going to be a great feature. It's just going to replace what you put in here with that new field that's being imported. But then anybody who wasn't in your import document, which you know, would be those kids who left after the year or the kids who, do, who moved you know, to another school, they will all be left in there with last year or whatever terminology it was. This gives you the ability to very easily bring them up on a report, uh, to remove them using that same utility of remove patrons that we showed you just a moment ago. So consider this and make a note for yourselves. This is an important part of the you know, end of year or patron management process. I've seen some people's data where they've just got a balloon <laughs> of all these people in their, in their program because they never remove anybody. And that can begin to get confusing. So that's a very important uh, little utility there. Anyway, so that's the end of our utilities, and that's kind of the end of all of our main data. Uh, I do want to take the time now to kind of move it over to <clears throat> our Q&A section. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Seneca put up a poll for us and uh, give you guys a moment to kind of uh, fill out that poll, and we're just going to make sure we've got any questions that we're going to answer for the group. Uh, if anybody does need to leave, I know we're getting pretty close to our hour. Um, that's just fine. <laughs> all of this is recorded, so uh, you have the ability to listen to it later. All right, I'll give you the moment to do that. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for taking a moment to look at that poll. And uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move into our Q&A portion. 
uh, for uh, questions, it was kind of light. <laughs> Seneca was really great and got most of our questions answered. Uh, first and foremost, though, for uh, Patricia, she asked uh, regarding the notice, the, um, sorry, automatic notice feature, just trying to get there for us. <laughs> so if you remember under circulation and circulation settings here, this automatic email notifications, she asked if this is something that can be turned on only for some of those features, but not others. And the answer to that really is unfortunately not. Once this is turned on, it's enabled for everybody in the catalog. And the program, what it does is every day with its daily chores, it has kind of a, you know, something that runs in the background there that you don't see. It will just recognize people who meet those requirements of they've got a new hold or they've got an overdue item and it will send those out that morning and once it's needed. If you do need to control it a little bit more closely and have it only be for some groups, not others, that's when you would get to the reports. That's where it would come in handy to be able to manage them one group at a time because you have a lot more control of when you want to share them out, send them out and what you want to send out. So, um, and that's kind of what we talked about with our reports here. One last thing too, Seneca was really good. She reminded me that I did say something that was a little incorrect and uh, I just don't want to you know, put some bad information out there. It's good to have her, <laughs> or else I would be making all these mistakes, right? Um, under our grade table, under patrons, we have this advanced after. This is actually more tied to SIF is what it is. It, it won't automatically move them at that time. So um, my, my mistake, I misspoke there. We did have one more question come through. Um, Kathy would like to know, how do you get a list of the items a patron has checked out? Okay, perfect. So kind of a report of a patron's checked out items. That's great. So Kathy, we're gonna go ahead and pop under our reports here. And once under our reports, we're gonna go to our circulation section. Uh, when you're considering what reports to choose, think of circulation as people and items interacting. So any checkouts, losts, holds, anything like that is all under circulation. It's not just notices, it can be general information reports. So I'm gonna choose the information section here. And you'll see we have a few different options for just general lists of information. The top one is loaned items or checked out items. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that one there. And under our selections tab, you can specify what particular group you wanna see checked out items for. So if it's just for a particular homeroom, if it's for a particular grade, or if it's just for everybody, then you can, once you've specified what group, you can pop under options and you can specify your sort. Mm -hmm. And this one's very similar to the other ones. So if I wanna run a report of all checked out items for all homerooms or all grades, I can have a page break so that way I could print it and then say, hand it to my teacher who's in charge of that homeroom so they can help track down the checked out items or being you know, aware of them. And then lastly, a format. Uh, I did mention earlier that normally the top is the simplest, the bottom is the most complex. So depending on how much information you want, you'll choose that particular template. And again, it, since this is one you might be running regularly, try a couple of these and see which one you like and make sure it's what you're looking for. So uh, now that is also one that you can save and make scheduled. So if this is gonna be one you're gonna run regularly, and as you can take a look, we actually have some demo ones in here. So a loaned items list for, you know, Banner, maybe like a home of Banner or whoever. So that's something you can set up for yourself to run regularly and help you avoid having to manually run the report every time. So hopefully that gives you all the information you need. Do we have any other questions at all? We did have another one come in. Oh good, okay. Nita would like to know about going over patron reports for loaned items for a class, not overdue, but printing, um, it seems like a notice for like two, four, or one per page for loaned items, not overdue. Okay, perfect, great. So that's a great question, Nita. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to our notices and go back to our quick tab, since it's not one that we have saved. And We'll take a look and see which one I would probably run. Probably a coming due items notice, I would think, would be the one that I would choose. That's for items that are checked out, um, but it has information on there letting you know, or letting you communicate to the children, or whoever has the books checked out, that they have a due date for that particular item. So this is one, it doesn't necessarily have to be like coming due immediately, it could be just whenever. <laughs> so this one works well. It's, it, it's formatted just to give them more information. 
So not just the fact that it's checked out. Um, but once you've gone under there, of course, like any of the other ones, under selections, you want to specify information related to what data you want to collect. So you'll see one unique feature under this report selections is patrons with items due. So here you can specify what particular people are going to be having their items due within a particular time range. So for yourself, I would say if you're just wanting to run this for all items that are checked out, extend this time period to something quite a bit larger. So that way you're not worried about it, you know, coming, you, some people dropping off because it's going to be due, you know, too, too long out or something like that. That works well usually for uh, materials that for like class check, uh, class books that they read where they have them for more, you know, for like a couple months or something like that. So and then under the options tab, um, similar to the other ones, this is where you would just specify what information is going to be on that notice. Obviously, it's something that you're giving to a homeroom teacher who's handing it to the kids. They probably don't need contact information. But if it's something the office is handing out or whatever, or maybe you might need to have a phone number to call parents if you need to track something down, then you can add whatever information is needed. So, but that should give you a list of all those items that are checked out and not overdue so that you'll have those. And uh, of course, these can all be formatted to be two per page, four per page, or letters as well. Letters being a one per page. So, but hopefully that gives you all the information you need. Seneca, do we have any other questions I can answer for the group? Kathy would also like to know, can we get a history of all items a patron has checked out? Oh, okay. Patron history. Yes, perfect, awesome. Um, you can, under reports here, You can run, see if I can find it here real fast. Good questions. See, I love it when people ask, ask me questions because then I have to kind of source of stuff down here. Um, all right, so I think we might be actually altering that report. That's okay. <laughs> there are other places to find it. So you can pop under the patrons window and grab that. Bring up the specific patron you want history for. And then under statistics, you'll be able to run their show history report. What that does is that basically just creates a list of everything that they have checked out. And you can actually just print that or save it as a digital document. That also can be brought up under the circulation screen. So if you're not under patrons and you want to bring it up here, which sometimes may be more what you're used to because you may be working with a patron. Once you've gone ahead and brought up your patron at the top left of this cir circulation screen, you would just pop under the gear here at the bottom right, and you'll see there is a history option there as well. I don't think Darla has much history, so yeah, so pretty simple, and <laughs> not a lot. But for your other kids, you're gonna have, probably have a lot more. You'll see every book checked out, uh, lost items, that kind of stuff. It'll, everything will be on there. So, um, but that's the two ways that you can bring up that history report. Hopefully that gives you all that, all the info you need there. Let us know if you have any follow-up questions, of course. All right, anything else we can, uh, I think we're probably gonna need to call it an end. <laughs> we are past our hour. I wanna thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully uh, everything we talked about was useful. For any of it that you feel was, um, you know, there wasn't enough information shared, don't hesitate to follow up with us. We still have that wonderful group of uh, customer support reps who are ready and waiting on the phone to answer any of your questions. So, uh, but, Moving on, um, just gonna show you our contact information here. So that way you have that for quick reference if you don't happen to have it jotted down. Seneca is also gonna be posting a link to our survey as well. And you're gonna see that there in your Zoom window. So it should be popping up right there. Uh, if you guys have an opportunity, please jump in, fill out that survey, give us your thoughts. Uh, we want any suggestions you might have about how we can do these better, about how we can better meet your needs, and please mention any topics you want us to cover. So, all right, but thanks guys. Uh, look for the recorded version of this that's gonna be coming out here soon via email. Otherwise, we'll, we'll see you in the, the funny pages.